So uh, today Taylor just gave me a bunch of um, examples of functions. So uh, we're just going to do a bunch of examples of functions working out of their injective, surjective, making sure that we're solid on that. So let's get started. So our first example is called the characteristic function. Okay, this shows up in analysis. Uh, if I have S, a subset of the real numbers, okay, so I fix S, a subset of the real numbers, then I can define one sub S, okay, so that's a big one, and I usually emphasize the little tails so it's clear, of X is equal to one if x is an element of s and is equal to 0 if x is not an element of s. Okay, so if you take 1 to be yes and 0 to be no, this is just a function that you give it a number and it tells you if it's in the set or not. Yes, no, yes, yes, no. Okay, so let's do an example for the example. So if, say, s is the interval 0 to 1, the closed interval 0 to 1, then I can evaluate it, the characteristic function 1 of 0 to 1 on many different numbers, right? So I can say, uh, what is this characteristic function of 1 half? And it should be 1, because 1 half is in this set. But if I ask, um, is 3 in this set? Then the function says no, right? 3 is not in the set 0, 1. And this is the closed set 0, 1. So if I ask, is 0 in this set, then the function says yes, right? The endpoint is in the set. That's a closed interval. So that's all it does. Okay, so this is used um, in analysis sometimes. If you want to integrate only over a little region, you can still write an integral, you know, from minus infinity to infinity by putting in a characteristic function. Because the characteristic function zeroes out your function when you're outside of the set. Oh, let me graph this, since I did that in the other class. Right, so if I wanted to graph like this one, right, the function would be like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then at 0, it jumps up to 1. And then it's 1, 1, 1. And then at 1, it jumps back down to 0. Right, it's like no, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. So that's one important kind of function. Another important way to get a function is through domain restriction, okay, or restriction of the domain. So suppose um, that I'm given a function f with domain x and codomain y, which I'll write as f colon x to y. Right? So this means that's the name of the function. Hi, my name is f. I go from x to y. I take values in x, and I send them to values in y. Okay, so I'll, I'll use this shorthand a lot, and, and Taylor will use this shorthand too. Okay. So suppose that I have a function and I fix a subset D of the domain of X, okay, then F restricted to D does the same thing as X, uh, as F, but its domain is D. So it has a smaller domain. So let me illustrate that with an example. So suppose that my function is from R to R, and it sends x to x squared. All right, so I can graph this one. 
it looks like this. That's y is equal to x squared. So now let me take d, a subset of r, and I'm going to take the subset 0 to infinity. Okay. Then the graph of f restricted to d is, or restricted to 0 infinity, if you want to write what it is, right? Well, it's the same graph as f, but now I only write the part that's, in, that's above d, right? So before I could take any real number and square it, but when I restrict the domain, I only take the non-negative numbers and square them. These numbers are not in the domain, so there's nothing in this part of the graph. OK, so that's all that domain restriction does. And it looks like nothing, right? It looks like maybe not much is going on, but actually a lot has happened. So this function is not injective. And this function is injective. So a lot can happen. Yep? Ah, let's prove that. Right. So let's first recall the definition. So let's show that f is not injective. So let's first recall right, the definition of injective. <coughs> so one way to say it, so injective is like in. Right? So you want to think of how things are going into the other thing. I don't know. I'm just going to do this movement until you remember injectivity. So what I want, right, is that if I take two x's that are not the same and I push them, they're still not the same, right? When they go into it, they're still different than f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. If I have two different things, I get two different things. Another way to write this is the contrapositive. If f of x1 is equal to f of x2, right? I walk around, I find two little x's, and I'm like, holy gosh, you give the same output. Then they're actually, they were the same x to start with, right? And these are the same because if I have different things, then they'll map to different things. Is the same thing as saying, well, if they map to the same thing, then they were the same. Okay, another way to write this uh, that I think is very concrete, so is if y is in the image of f, right? If I, if I hit something, then there is a unique x. with f of x is equal to y, right? Which again goes with this, right? This is a y, and I'm saying if I get this y, like if I have maybe different x's giving me this y, then actually they're the same x, so it's a unique x. And now in, with this last sentence, maybe you can see why this is not injective. If I take the output Four, there's two inputs that give me that output, right? Two and negative two is a counterexample, so it's not injective, right? So here, so right, all these definition of injectivities are kind of like always, right? Whenever f of x is equal, f of x one is equal to f of x two, x one is equal to f x two. Whenever x1 is not x2, then f of x1 is not f of x2. 
to mess up a whenever, you only need one counterexample, right? Like, if you have a reliable car, it's always reliable. If one day the brakes break and you fall into a ditch and die, then your car was not reliable. Right? So I need one to show F is not injective. I need one counterexample. So I can say, um, x1 is 2, and x2 is negative 2, and 2 is not equal to negative 2, but ugh, I don't want to go back and, and do my picture. But f of x1 is equal to f of x2, because 2 squared is equal to minus 2 squared. They're both the number 4. All right, so that's not injective. Whereas this one is injective, how did I get rid of my problem? Like mafia style, right? It was like, there's two of you, you'll, you'll die, right? All these guys, I was like, you're no longer in the club. So now, when I want to know what maps to four, there's only two, right? Because I got rid of negative two. So I, it's, it's a pretty um, brutal, serious way to get rid of this problem. But it did the job. I made this function injective by getting rid of all the, doppel the negative doppelgangers on the side. OK, so um, another way to see injectivity from a graph is that each horizontal line touches the graph in at most one place. Right? Because one way for me to monitor how many inputs give me that output is to swoop a horizontal line. I want to see what gives me the output 4, 2 does. What give me the output five? Square root of five does, right? So here, if I swoop a horizontal, here I hit nothing. That's fine, whatever, right? But up here, when I start hitting stuff, I hit only one number ever. Whereas this one, right, as soon as I go up of zero, I hit two numbers, because there's two numbers that give me the same output. Okay, neither of these are surjective. This is not surjective. And this is also not surjective. Okay, that restricting the domain didn't help me with surjectivity. Actually, restricting the domain will never help you with surjectivity if it's not surjective. It's not by taking away things that you'll make it surjective. Even the first one's not surjective? No. Do you get all of the real numbers? I don't get any of the bottom ones. Yeah, because I'm saying my codomain is the real numbers. So let me write that down too, though, for the. So I'm going to keep going here. Show that f is not surjective. This is good. The same questions came up in the other lecture, so now they're the same. Right? So again, the definition of surjectivity. So f is surjective. Okay, so this one I have a little advantage over you guys. My first language is French, and in French, sur means on. So this one is about on, like hitting the target, right? Injectivity is about going, like in a certain way, staying separate as you go. But in surjectivity is about being on your target. So this says that if for every y in the codomain of f, there is x in the domain of f with f of x is equal to y. Okay. How to see this in picture okay, on a graph is 
f is surjective if every horizontal line hits the graph. Right, because a horizontal line monitors my inputs. So here I'm like, okay, is there something that gives four? Yes, two. If there's something that gives one, yes, one. But here, when I'm doing my horizontal line, I'm like, if there's, is there something that where in I square it, I get negative two, and there's no x on the left or right that gives me that. And same for this, right? Here, when I'm up here, I'm like, is there something that gives me four? There's two things, but it doesn't help me. I mean, you know, with surjectivity, I just want to know that there's something. Right? But when I'm down here, there's nothing. Like when I'm like, oh, does anything give me minus four? No. Right? So both injectivity and surjectivity are about horizontal lines, if you want, from the graph. Surjectivity is the line should always touch. Everything must get hit. And injectivity is that it gets hit once by one thing. So you touch it only in one spot when you touch. Okay, so in at most one place, and this one is in at least one place. Okay, so, um, so again, right, to show that F is not surjective, because this is a for every, so I just need one Y to fail, and then they have kind of all failed collectively. Okay, so to show that F is not surjective, I need one counterexample. And so maybe y is equal to negative 2, right? There is no x in the real numbers such that negative 2 is equal to x squared. Right. So this is dependent on my domain here, that I said the domain was the real numbers. If you know about the complex numbers, then that would become surjective, because there would be a complex number, such that when I square it, I get negative 2. But I said, no, I only have real numbers, so there isn't. Right? There's nothing here in the real numbers. Okay, so function restriction, a good way to get rid of your problems. Okay, let's do another example. I'll just start right over from the side. All right, so my next example, I'm going to let G be a group. And I'm going to let G be any element of G. Then I can make a function from my group to my group, right, so the domain is group elements. It takes a little group element, x, and it sends it to the group element, g times x. Okay, so that's a function. And this one is surjective and injective. So I'm going to show that. But first, let's do an example of my example, a concrete example. OK, so I'm going to, for a minute or many minutes, I'm going to let my group be the integers with addition. The integers are a group under addition. I can add two numbers and get another number, right, another whole number. Um, the addition is associative. There's an inverse. I can undo addition by doing subtraction. And there's an identity, right? The identity is zero. And here I'm going to let g be any element of my group. Maybe I'll let g be two. Okay? It, do it doesn't matter what number I pick, but I pick two. Then my function, f, would go from the integers to the integers, and it would take a number x, and then it would do 2 to it, 
right? And what does g do? g adds. So it would take x and it would add 2. Right? That's what I mean by doing 2. Okay? So I'm going to start by showing that this one is injective and surjective. And then I'm going to do this one is injective and surjective. And you'll see it's the same proof because it's the same example. Okay, so uh, let's start with f is surjective. Right. So for surjective, I need to let y be any integers, right? And I need to exhibit x such that f of x is equal to y. Right. So I'm going to do some side work. I'm going to move to the sideboard. This is the stuff you don't show. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing you like the backstage of math. Okay, so I need x with f of x is equal to y. How am I going to do that? Well, first, right, I figure f of x is x plus 2. So I want x such that x plus 2 is y. Well, that seems manageable, right? I know how to do that. If I just subtract 2 from both sides, right, I'm going to get that this x should be y minus 2. So I'm like, OK, now I feel pretty confident, right? Any y, if, you, if I pick y minus 2, then y minus 2 will get me y, right, after I do the function. So I did this reasoning. So now I pretend like I knew this all along. Right, I'm back to my real life, my real proof. Let y be in z. Right, I must exhibit x with f of x is equal to y. So um, if x is equal to y minus 2. Right? Look, at, look at that, I just have this x lying around. Oh, what do you know? Let's see if it works. It works because I rigged it to work, right? So I'm like, if x is equal to y minus 2, then f of x, that's f of y minus 2, okay? So that's y minus 2 plus 2, because f adds 2. And now by associativity, I can write that this is, okay, I can write f of x is equal to y plus minus 2 plus 2, that's y plus 0, that's y. Right? So I had to give you, I had to convince you that there was an x. The best way to convince someone that there is an x is to show them the x. Right? Just show the money. Open the suitcase, it's in there. Right? So I was like, OK, you, you think I can't find an x? I found an x. That's the x. This x, when I do f of x, I'll get y. And then I show you. I open my suitcase and I'm like, I do have a million dollars. It would be amazing if I had a million dollars. But instead I have a surjective function, which is just as good. Okay, So f is surjective. Now I need to show that f is injective. And I'm going to use a second characterization. right? I started. If I have two different x's, I want to show the y's are different, right? The outputs that I get are different. But it's actually just a little bit easier to start with two things that, are, that give the same output and then show that they'll have to be the same input. Usually, logically, that's the easier y. So I'm going to let x1 and x2 be integers. And they are such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2, right? So if they're different, that'll be trouble. So I need to show that they have to be actually, they were the same to start with, OK? I'll leave my side work here. OK, so if f of x1 is equal to f of x2, then x1 plus 2 is equal to x2 plus 2, right? That's what f of x1 is, and that's what f of x2 is. If they're equal, then x1 plus 2 is equal to x2 plus 2. But now maybe you see what I can do. I can subtract 2, right, from both sides. So then I'll get x1 plus 2 
minus 2 is equal to x2 plus 2 minus 2. And then by my same work that I did there, right, that's x1 plus 2 minus 2, and that's x2 plus 2 minus 2, and so that's x1 is equal to x2. So I did get it, right? I started with two x's, not necessarily the same, but I assumed that they gave me the same output. Then I obtained as a logical consequence that they had to be the same input. Therefore, f is injective. If I get to the same place and I rewind, I was at the same place. I had the same x's to start with. OK? So now I'm going to adapt this to this case. right? I'm going to do the general group case. So um, you'll have that in your notes. I have to erase my board, but they'll, it'll look the same. You, you can see the parallels. Yes? With not, so that's it. We have minus 2. Yeah, so I had, so I start knowing that x plus 2 is, e x2, x1 plus 2 is equal to x2 plus 2. So can Yeah, that's what I do here. That's as direct as you can get. Yeah, we do the process minus 2. You can't do it without doing minus 2. Well, because how can you go between this and that, right? How can you start with two numbers if you add two is the same as they, they're the same? It's because you can do minus two that they're equal. So let me, okay, so let's not do the group right away. Let's do an example that's not injective. And, and maybe you'll see what goes wrong, okay? So um, not an injective function. Okay, and, and we have one. It's r, f goes from r to r, x goes to x squared. Is the one that I just did, right? And I showed it wasn't injective by showing one counterexample. But let's say you were starting the proof, right? So I'm going to let x1 and x2, uh, x1 and x2 just be in r, right? and be such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. Then x1 squared is equal to x2 squared. Right? So I'm at the same step here. I was like, OK, then x1 plus 2 is equal to x2 plus 2. Then x1 squared is equal to x2 squared. Right? But now the crucial step is that here I can undo it, right? I can, I had plus two, I can undo it. I can do minus two. I can't undo squaring, right? Because if you take the square root, you'll get plus minus, right? Even if I try, I'm like, okay, then I'm gonna take the square root on both sides, but then I'll get plus or minus the square root, right? When you take this, the square root on both sides, you don't just get the answer if you have, x squared is equal to 4, right? This means that x is plus or minus the square root of 4, which is plus or minus 2, right? So it's because you can't undo squaring that this fails, right? You, you get that x1 is equal to plus or minus x2, not equal. Whereas here, plus 2 is undoable because g is a group. Right? I'm d I mean, the inverse of 2 is minus 2. And so I can do the inverse to undo it and get back that x1 is equal to x2. Right? And in both cases, actually, I erased the um, surjective. Right? But even in the surjective case, the minus 2 came up. So it's all about inverses, right? which a group is a place where you have an inverse. No, 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 I mean, different functions are going to be different, right? Like squaring, you could 
take it to be a binary operation like multiplying or something. I guess it's not really a binary operation. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand your question. Like, um, do, the, do the operations have to be, or like the, the minus two works uh, in that case, do they have to be um, like linear? Where like no, you could do it with anything else that was a group. Okay. Yeah, you could do um, multiplication of matrices or any any other group that you might know from the school. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't like draw from an example that you did before because I wasn't here. But it, it would group more work for any group. It doesn't need to be linear. So an inverse has to exist. An inverse has to exist. So, so like e to the x is injective because you can take ln to undo it. But uh, singular mat matrices wouldn't work. Then it wouldn't, right? So you would need invertible matrices okay. because you're doing matrix multiplication Matrix, matrices with multiplication is not a group because you don't always have inverses because of the stupid singular matrices, right? It's like integers under multiplication. If you could do matrix addition, then you can undo it by doing matrix subtraction. So matrices are a group under addition, just like the integers. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so let's do the general case. It's going to be just like this. Right, but it helps. I mean, if you're if you're ever doing a proof and you're not sure, just like have an example of a group, right? So by now you should all pick your favorite group, and like always carry it with you for everything. Like I, you know, like being a mathematician is like picking a lot of favorites. Like your favorite number minus five, you know. So if I need a number, I have five. If I need a group, or the integers. Like you, you just get your examples. And now I'm going to do the same thing, but just in general. But it's going to be informed by what I did. right? So now back to G any group. Right? I'm going to say F is surjective. I'm going to let Y be any element of my group. OK, side work. I need x with f of x is y. So I need x, right, such that g times x is equal to y. How do I get that? Well, what I did before, which I just erased, that was maybe not the smartest thing I did today, right, is I subtracted on both sides to undo the plus 2. So here, I'm going to multiply both sides by g inverse to undo the g. So if I do g inverse gx, that's equal to g inverse times y. Yeah? Isn't that first thing just the definition of closure? And if so, then don't all groups have that by default? So what I'm saying, so it's true that if I have an x, I'll get a y. But now I'm saying if I have a y, can I get an x? So that's the other way, yeah. But they all groups will have this by default, because I'm about to show it, that you can also, if you have a y, get an x. Right? So here, by associativity, that's g inverse g times x. That's just still g inverse y. And now g, g inverse is the identity. Right? So I can write maybe e times x is g inverse y. And then I get that x is g inverse y. Okay? So that's my side work. So I'm like, oh, I have the x for you. Okay, so now I go back to my real proof. I pretend like I knew this all along. Right? Like, give me a y, any y. If I pick x is equal to g inverse of y, then I'm going to show you f of x is going to be y. I found the x. f of x is f of g inverse y. Okay, but that's g times g inverse y, because f just does multiplication by g. And now by associativity, I have g times g inverse times y. And now by my same trick, I have e times y, and that's just y. Okay, So f flip back to surjectivity for z, for the integers in your notes, if you're taking notes. Otherwise, use your imagination. Right? These are the same steps that I did. Right? I was like, OK, I'm going to let x be y minus 2. Then f of f x is f of y minus 2. 
and then I did plus 2, which is like doing G. And then I was like the plus 2 and the minus 2 cancel to 0. And 0 plus y is y. So here I'm doing 1 times y is y, or e times y is y. Right, but it's the same proof, just translating doing 2 to doing G. And undoing 2, right? subtracting 2 is doing G inverse. Now I'm going to do injectivity, and I'm going to follow that same. So I'm going to just rewrite that above here. F is injective. I'm going to let x1 and x2, this time they will be in G, be such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. So now I'm going to follow these steps, but with my group G. Right. Okay, If f of x1 is equal to f of x2, this means that g times x1 is equal to g times x2. Right. And now you think, oh my gosh, I did g to x. Can I undo it? Yes. I can apply g inverse on both sides. And now by associativity, I get g inverse g times x1. That's g inverse g times x2. And so that's e times x1, the identity, e times x2. And that's x1 is equal to x2. The same steps, right? just with my group g. Okay, that's how you build, up, you build up to the abstraction. Just like, what would I do for this group? That's what I do for all groups. I'm always, the reason this is injective is that G is undoable, right? There's an inverse. The reason it didn't work for X squared is that squaring is not undoable. Once you've squared a number, you forgot forever if it was positive or negative, right? If I'm like, ooh, I lost my number, but I know its square is 4, you're like, well, you're screwed. You'll never know if your number was 2 or minus 2, right? Subtract, uh, squaring is not undoable. Yep. So then there are no groups where squaring is the operation? Well, squaring is undoable if you have the positive numbers. Oh, okay. So you could do that. Yeah. Usually we'll talk um, of squaring like as a group homomorphism, like not an operation, yeah. but yeah. So it, it depends what you're looking for. But here for functions, right, like squaring is not injective because it's not undoable. And anything undoable is injective. And basically, the definition of not being undoable is being not injective, right? Say I have a number, and I know the sign of that number is 0. It could be anything, right? It could be 0, it could be 2 pi, it could be pi, it could be, you know? Because sign is very not injective, right? Any horizontal line hits sign in infinitely many spots. So once you've taken the sign of a number, that's it. But if you restrict to 0 to pi, say, OK, that. You know, like, so it depends what you're talking about. Like, you need to think carefully about it. So wait, so we finish at 40. OK, we still have 20 minutes. I, I just wanted to know like which ones of these examples I should do. OK, let's do uh, one little exotic example for, you know, to be a little different, and then we'll do a difficult example. Okay, so uh, the dot product. Well, if you've taken this class, then it's not going to be exotic at all, but that's a function. Okay, I'll denote, um, so there's two many ways to denote the dot product of two vectors, v1 and v2. Um, Taylor in the notes does these angled brackets, v1 angle v2. And this is um, if v1 is, for example, in R2, so it's the vector a1, b1, and v2 is the vector a2, b2, then this is a1 times a2 plus b1 times b2. So you take the first coordinate, you multiply it with the first coordinate, then you take the second coordinate, you multiply it by the second coordinate, and you add. You can also thinking of ma matrix multiplication for v1 as a row vector and v2 as a column vector if you've seen matrix multiplication. If not, forget I said that. 
Okay, so this will give me a function f. What will it take? It will take a pair of vectors, right? It will take an element of r2 cross r2, so a pair of vectors v1, v2, and it will output a number, the number that is v1 dot v2. Okay, so, so that just ends up being a number, right? It's no longer a matrix or it's no longer a vector. It's just a number. Okay, so that, you know, so it doesn't always be R to R or Z to Z, right? The domain and codomain can be different. Anything can happen. Okay. So let's do uh, maybe a more difficult example. So um, I'm going to let f, so this one is going to be a, a z to z one, okay, but, but it's going to be special. So I'm going to let f of x be x minus 1 if x is even, and I'm going to let f of x be um, x plus 5 if x is odd. And uh, what we'll prove is that we'll show that f is surjective. Okay, so that means for all y in the integers, there exists x with f of x is equal to y, right? Remember, surjective is about hitting your target. Every target has an arrow pointing to it, has a number going to it. So I'm going to recreate what happened this morning when I taught the first class, right? I was like, well, it says it's surjective, but do I even believe it, right? Is that even true that this is surjective? So I'm going to start by just playing with it, right? If, if, I, if I can, I'm going to give myself some whys, right, some challenge whys. And I'm going to find the x that goes to this y. And maybe that's going to tell me how I could show that any y is the image. OK, so let's do some challenges. Right? So say y was 5. OK, what is x with f of x is equal to 5? I need to find that. Is there anything right that when I plug in? So first, it's complicated because I don't know if x is even or odd to start with, right? But okay, pretend that I start with an even number, right? Like I'll, I'll look at x plus one first, right? So um, maybe f of x is just x minus one, right? Maybe I'm in the first case, and then what I want is that x minus 1 is equal to 5, or that x is equal to 6. Right, so I solve. It's like I solved before to show that x plus 2 was surjective. Right? I solved. I was like, x plus 2 is equal to y. Well, then y should be, x should be y minus 2. So I solved here. Okay, but I need to check, right, because I said maybe. Okay? So if I pick 6, and I put it in this function, f of 6, well, 6 is even, so I will do minus 1. So I will get 6 minus 1, I will get 5. So f of 6 is 5. Oh, well, that worked out. Okay, well, at least 5 is in the image. Right. Um, so let's try another number, maybe 3. Okay, well, let's, let's try. That worked out, right? What is x with f of x is 3. Well, maybe f of x is x minus 1. So I would want a number x such that x minus 1 was 3. So that would be that x is equal to 4. And lo and behold, f of 4 is 3. 
because when I plug in 4, 4 is even, so I do 4 minus 1 and I get 3. So let's try, maybe you're seeing where I'm going to go with this. Let's try an even number. What if I do y is equal to 2? Right? So I can do the same thing, right? If f of x is equal to x minus 1, I'm looking for x minus 1 is equal to 2, so that would be x is equal to 3. So maybe f of 3 is equal to 2. Are they trying to come in? Or they're just like hitting the door? Thank you for getting that. Did they leave a message? No. A present? Candy? There was no one for the camera. OK. But f of 3, right, if I do f of 3, 3 is odd. So I'll do 3 plus 5. That's 8. Right? So I don't get 2. Wah, wah. But maybe, but maybe I was in this case, right? So maybe f of x is x plus 5, and now I'm looking for something like x plus 5 is 2, and that would be x is negative 3. If I plug in negative 3, f of negative 3, negative 3 is odd, and negative 3 plus 5 is 2. So it's true. So I'm seeing here that there's something about being odd or even. right? And in fact, right, if x is even, then x minus 1 is odd. And if x is odd, then x plus 5 is even. right? If I take an even number and I subtract 1, I get an odd. I think that's pretty clear. you got everybody paired up and you take someone away, then someone will be alone. But if I start with an odd number and I add 5, I'll get an even number, right? Because I have an, a lonely singleton in my x because it's odd, and 5 has a lonely singleton, and then the two singletons can get together and make a pair, so I'll get an even number. Okay? So, this work right, tells me that when I start here, I need to be a little bit careful if y is even or odd. Yep? Oh, so would you start to replace the, uh, replace the x's with like 2k and 2k plus 1 for like any odd or even number? Like you could do that, but I'm not going to need that here. Okay. Yeah. You could, like, if you wanted to prove that this were odd, then you could let x be 2k, and then you would be like, x minus 1 is 2k minus 1, you know, and then you could say, like, that's 2k minus 1 plus 1. So it's 2 times the number plus 1, so it's odd, right? So you could do that. But here I'm not going to need that for this proof. The only way that I'm using it, right, is, is, like, what function I'm plugging into. So I'm going to let... So now that's the real proof, right? So you do all of this work on your own time, and then you pretend like that did not happen, and you knew it all along. So let me pretend I knew all this the whole time, which I did because this is my second lecture, but I didn't before. Okay, so let y be in z. If y is odd, right, so a case like this, like y is equal to 5, then I'm going to pick x, to be y plus 1. Let x to be y plus 1. Right, that's the x that worked. Then x is even. Right, if I start with an odd number and I add 1, I get an even number. So f of x is equal to, right, x is even, so it's equal to, well, it's equal to f of y plus 1, right, because x is y plus 1, but it's also equal to y plus 1 minus 1, right? I use this version of the rule because x is even. But now y plus 1 minus 1, that's y. Right, so I showed 
if y is odd, the x that will work, right, show the money, open your suitcase, here's a million dollars, is the y plus 1 will work. If I plug in y plus 1, I'll get y. So now I've shown that every odd number is in the image of this function. So I have to show that every even number is in the image of this function, and then that's all the numbers, so all the numbers will be in the image, and it will be surjective. So if y is even, this time I'm going to let x be y minus 5, right? Because here, that's what I had to do for an even number. Okay, so I'm just going to finish this quickly. Yeah, oh, I'm over time, sorry. It'll be fast. Then x is odd, right? If I have even and if I subtract 5, I get odd. And f of x is f of y minus 5, because that's what x is. But also, x is odd, so I use this rule. So I get y minus 5 plus 5. Right? I'm using my bottom rule, which is adding 5. And y minus 5 plus 5 is y. So in either case, I exhibited an x that gave me that y. All right, so um, have a good weekend.